I want to, this is, this is a basic topic, but it has a number of, of carry-ons that are far from basic. Um, and I want to, um, I want to go through some, some high level understanding here and make sure everyone's at, at a, at a sort of on a level playing field with respect to some of the, um, the essentials. Uh, before we dive into topics like calibration, or we talk about particle filtering, or we talk about parameterization, etc. Um, so what I'm hoping uh, to talk about is here, um, at a high level, several different ways in which models interface with data. I want to talk about direct model parameterization, indirect model parameterization, calibration, in fact, I've extended these slides recently to also include uh, a technique um, uh, sort of somewhat confusingly named filtering, okay? Um, which those who were in my last boot camp will know took a central position within that, within that boot camp. So this is one set of major discussion. Most of my time will be spent on this. But I also want to talk about this issue which lurks behind the surface um, and is becoming increasingly relevant in the exchange interface and dialogue between, on the one hand, dynamic modeling, and on the other, a, a contemporary, um, uh, another contemporary, highly um, uh, dynamically focused, and a computational tradition, namely um, uh, those associated with big data and machine learning and data science. Um, everyone in the room will be familiar with the very rapid rise of, of prominence in data science, including within the health sciences. And I will let you know that many of the people who are interested in computational modeling um, within health, uh, a fair number of them are, are placing emphasis on the data science side and not quite sure where dynamic modeling and computational modeling of that sort fit in. Um, and conversely, those on the dynamic modeling side have, oft have, have had for a number of years a somewhat, a somewhat um, uh, uncertain sort of way of approaching what does data science, how does data science um, interface with dynamic modeling and what is the proper relationship between the two. So there's a lot of back and forth going on right now uh, between the dynamic modeling world, a rich computational tradition with a focus on, on um, uh, behavior over time and on uh, high velocity perspectives on the world and informing policy on the one hand, and the, the world of data science and machine learning, which often deals with data that's not only high volume, but high velocity, high variety, and can resolve things at the level of individual causal pathways as well. And so there's a lot of ferment going on about this. And those in the room may be familiar with the fact that um, several weeks ago, I offered on this very campus a course that basically gave um, uh, a vision and um, which introduced participants to a set of concrete methods that bring together dynamic modeling and data science in a very specific way. And, and I gave a vision which argued that, uh, that each of them needs the other to achieve their full potential and that the two techniques are not merely complementary, not merely not in opposition, um, but are in fact uh, synergistic. And uh, much of my lab's work over the past, you know, several, past uh, 10 years has been focused on this interface. And the students around you, many of them have engaged with tools that are um, simultaneously tapping into uh, rich veins of data science, system science, and, and often combinations between them. Uh, Chen Yang's work being a sort of prominent example of that. So I'm going to talk about dynamic modeling 
uh, in the context of, of, of data science in the area of filtering, but I'm also going to be talking about it from more of a philosophical standpoint with respect to this latter point, data, uh, dynamic modeling in the presence of data limitations. Because one of the common refrains I hear from in some quarters is, we'd like to do dynamic modeling, but we don't have we don't have good enough data, or we don't have enough data, or we, we um, you know, our data is poor quality, um, and therefore we're not ready. And I want to try to address this issue, um, because the situation with, um, with dynamic modeling and data limitations has a lot of texture to it. And uh, I want to speak, speak to that. Um, and that also has implications for its relationship with data science. Okay. Um, so, in a traditional, in, in its traditional practice, dynamic models and data have interfaced in three major capacities. You'll notice I even put filtering here because it's it's not uh, it's not as uh, well integrated into the canon traditionally. It's been used in some quarters of dynamic modeling, but has seen very little use, for example, in, uh, in the health sciences. But traditionally, there's been three ways in which data interface with models, that, that models meet up with and have, a, uh, uh, you know, have an exchange with data. One is parameter estimates for the model. Here, data is being provided into the model um, as, as values for parameters. In other words, to, to, to shape the assumptions made in the model, okay? And a, a, um, another way in which data interfaces with the model is, goes variously by the names calibration or automated parameter estimation or even parameter estimation, confusingly, um, in some quarters. And here, we're not putting data directly into the model because the data we have from the world doesn't relate to any one component of the model or, or you know, one or two components in isolation. We can't just say, assume this. Instead, what we're trying to do is adjust other model or you know, model assumptions on different areas of the model so that the model best reproduces that data. In other words, this data from the world corresponds to emergent data from the model. Remember, we, we uh, characterized endogenous factors, endogenous factors, and then factors which are ignored uh, in a model. Um, and I, I argued that that, um, that there are times where you represent something in the model exogenous. You tell the model, assume this. Um, it's pre-specified. That's what these were. These were things that were pre-specified, right? Um, the exogenous things. We're telling the model to assume this. We tell the model about it, um, about what to what to uh, what values to use. So these are pre-specified things. We are telling the model what to um, what to assume there. Pre-specified. Okay. Um, by contrast, endogenous things, the model tells to us. It generates these. So these are generated by the model, right? Um, so generated by the model. And generally, although I've never shown it in this diagram before, um, uh, you learn something new every day. Um, calibration, so, so parameter, parameter estimation is traditional form. When we're specifying assumptions for those models, um, that relates to these guys, these exogenous guys. So this is where, um, I wish I had a different color yet. Um, uh, does anyone have uh, a Wade or, or, or Jason? I know you have bags of many tricks. Um, and do you have anything other than black and blue? Uh, yeah, red would be awesome. Okay, thanks. Black and blue can get a bit bruising after a while. Um, uh, okay, so. So this is the province of parameter estimation. We are telling the model um, 
assume assume this certain certain thing. Parameter estimation is the process of it. Uh, parameter estimation. Thank you so much, Jason. This is awesome. Um, for these things, this is the province of calibration. Why? Because we don't get to tell it what to assume about endogenous things. It's telling us. This is what it's producing. This is what it's generating. And what we can do, though, is if we want a model that has a certain degree of face validity, we want what it generates to match data from the world that's uh, in a way that uh, suggests the model is reproducing patterns in the world in a reasonable way. But we know we're not totally out to lunch with this model. We know that the model, um, uh, when we run it in a historic context, we'll see patterns like we see historically uh, uh, resulting from the model. And that lends confidence about the model. Um, Jack Homer speaks about modeling as, as uh, as something uh, where you're engaged in confidence building over time. There's a, a group that refers to a third process called validation, where you're, you're, you're developing confidence, you're, you're assessing, you're evaluating the degree to which the model is acceptable by comparing its outputs often, its, its uh, behavior against empirical data. And there's a very strong camp within modeling that cuts across modeling traditions, age-based, dysmonamics, discrete event simulation, but it's particularly strongly felt within discrete event simulation that argues for very rigorous validation strategies uh, that say, you know, um, uh, you have to plan ahead and, and you're, you should have you know, defined validation criteria and you'll validate a model against data not used to build it, obviously, because otherwise that would be presupposing the thing we're trying to use to evaluate it. And, um, and you have uh, validation going on in that quarter, um, in that way, and you have validation tests. And, and it almost gets to the point of, of what you see sometimes, what you see as, as the norm in, in machine learning, which has um, uh, multiple cross-validation, et cetera. By contrast, there's another uh, camp, particularly prominent in system dynamics, who argues, look, um, what you should be talking about is instead not validation. Models are learning tools. It's, it's not a matter of saying this model is unworthy. It's, it's not going to be considered. We're always learning from models. And what you should be doing is developing confidence that a model um, uh, matches things, but viewing it as a um, as kind of a provisional model until you you know you find something where uh, it's off, which undercuts your confidence in it, and then you invest further in it. Okay, so you, you get both quarters within within the sphere of of data science. And if you look at different papers within data science to be an informed consumer, you should realize that papers in one area may make a big um, you know, put a big amount of emphasis into formal formal validation steps, where in other quarters they say, "Look, this is not so much our goal. We're engaged in a constant um, a constant process of developing confidence, checking that confidence, and revising the model." So parameter estimates are are throughout these models. So the model that Kurt presented yesterday, for example had uh, a number, uh, a wide variety of parameters estimated with discrete choice theory, but it also had parameters drawn from US uh, tobacco literature or surveys, et cetera. Um, and uh, the model that Chen Yang presented had tremendous amounts of data that were informed from papers, uh, dozens of papers, um, uh, derivations of parameter estimates in formal model. And it's very common to have to have models uh, uh, have data go into them that represent certain assumptions. Maybe it's some um, you know, hazard rate of becoming diabetic for an individual who's obese and a certain age and sex, the likelihood that they will develop uh, diabetes um, uh, per year. Or maybe it's a mortality rate associated with deaths of those 
who have developed diabetes with complications, um, the mortality rate associated with that population. Maybe it's the number of contacts people have per, per month who are needle sharing users, and uh, so the number of, of times they will uh, engage in intravenous drug use, and the proportion, uh, conversely, another parameter might be the proportion of, of those that they, where they engage in needle sharing um, within the current, um, uh, the current situation. These, these assumptions are often made in a model, and, um, and often we need some provisional values to be put in for them. Now, these estimates can come from many sources, and it's very common within the modeling literature to be very specific about where, from what source you have drawn a particular assumption or estimate. So um, one of the recurrent um, structures you see within uh, modeling papers is a table of parameter values where you will see a parameter, a description of that parameter, baseline value, often a unit. You'll notice here um, uh, this table mentions the unit kind of together with the value. Often you will see a unit specified. And then a reference for where, from whence it was, uh, it was drawn, okay? Um, uh, this is uh, a common, um, common construct. Um, and many reviewers will look for a construct such as this. And they'll say, tell me where you got your assumptions about this, this, or this. Um, the data sources are often varied. Um, you might have controlled trial data, RCTs, which might allow estimates of certain things. Some, for some of, many of these, these might be ecological estimates drawn from surveillance data or, or outbreak reports um, from contact tracing investigations. Uh, uh, and uh, from clinical reports. Um, there is varying appetite within the modeling literature towards what is commonly referred to as expert judgment. Mm -hmm. Jason, I appreciate you keeping the, the camera um, in good order. Um, expert judgment, this is, uh, expert judgment uh, basically would mean you get someone who's very familiar with the system, um, and lives and breathes their work with the system, giving a rough estimate for something, even if they don't have data specifically on that, they'll say, well, from my experience, you know, we get um, um, medication errors um, that are, are known, um, you know, recognized medication errors occurring about once every so many patients, or, or you know, um, it takes about this amount of time for us to see to do a history workup on a patient um, who has these characteristics. And, and that expert judgment is then used to put the assumptions into the model. Um, uh, there are different norms in different sub-areas of modeling um, to, uh, to the uh, acceptability of expert judgment. But what I will tell you is that by and large within modeling, you will see it um, uh, quite frequently. Um, uh, there may be some quarters of modeling where it's evidenced enough that this will be viewed as, as not, not flying. Um, now, I say that these sources for parameter estimates, um, I've sort of listed the original sources. The truth is that for many of these, before you can, it, it's not like these parameters are always listed in a direct way in these sources unless uh, some of the sources are, um, are in fact model papers or are very, uh, are, are the results of analyses of, of data sources. So you will find some papers, for example, which might, which might talk about the epidemiology of, of intravenous drug use and patterns seen in Baltimore for IDU use among drug addicts who, who uh, uh, you know, who have a certain condition, say hep C, and talk about the frequency of their needle sharing. Um, in which case you might draw on that directly. But generally speaking, if you're talking about data sources, like surveillance data, RCT data, um, outbreak data, uh, administrative data, 
often there's a certain amount of analysis that has to go on that you have to do before you arrive at a parameter that you put into the model. Okay, um, so there's there's times where this is more direct, um, particularly for drawing on other modeling papers, um, and there's times where it's less direct. I will note, I, I probably should add to this, um, um, you know, previous modeling papers. And in fact, I had mentioned um, the norms um, uh, that um, that some areas of modeling have about reuse of modeling um, results that unless you have theory or data that strongly motivate an innovation, you should use the results of past studies and their assumptions. So scientific, you're building on the shoulders of giants. And uh, there's some modeling practitioners who think that, um, that this marks good science if you can reuse estimates from previous modeling so that those who read your paper will know that it's reusing um, many assumptions, but it's got these particular new contributions. So parameter estimates are very important. They're used for the exogenous factors, but often we are not, um, not certain. We might have a set of estimates from the literature, or we have rough estimates as to, uh, to certain quantities given to us by expert judgment. Um, or we have different surveys which give different results about how often people quit smoking per year, you know, attempt to quit smoking based on their, um, uh, their history of smoking. So um, here we'll often end up pairing parameter estimates with sensitivity analysis. And if you're making assumptions about parameters, um, it is considered not merely good practice, but almost required practice to engage in sensitivity analysis to see a given assumption, how sensitive is model output to this assumption. So in terms of the model outcomes you are interested in, to what degree are they highly sensitive to a particular assumption? With the thought being that in nonlinear models, there may be some assumptions, particularly if you're in certain quarters of what's called the underlying state space, where you make that change in that assumption makes very little difference. And there may be other parameters where it makes a huge difference. And when you try to figure out where to put your limited amounts of time and effort in data collection, it will behoove you to do a sensitivity analysis and say, you know, is this, is the model, are the model um, findings that I am driving likely to be strongly contingent upon the particular value that I've chosen or is it robust within a broad range of assumptions? And you will find both cases very readily demonstrated within models of the sort we're looking at here. Um, so there are some cases where you double a parameter value or half it, it makes almost no difference to the results you're interested in. There are other times where you increase it by 10% and you know the disease takes off instead of dying out. And, and so you need to be aware that that in order to apportion your emphasis on parameters and sweat, how much a particular estimate matters, sensitivity analysis is a process that's readily conducted and that will shed great light on the importance of uncertainty with respect to model parameters. Now, I will note that it follows that if you find a parameter, if you find a model, with respect to the outcomes you're interested in to be highly sensitive to, to the estimates, then often we put quite a bit more emphasis in getting a good estimate for it. I've been known to go heavily invest to the tunes of uh, you know, over $10,000 to try to get a hold of data that will inform our models about a highly sensitive estimate. Uh, so we've requested you know, administrative data to allow us to estimate certain, certain parameters which seem to be key for model outcomes. Um, and, um, and in other cases, we'll put lots of emphasis into calibrating parameters which are less well known, but where it's really sensitive. I will note, and we'll come back to sensitivity analysis, but I'll just note that when you think about sensitivity analysis, be aware, sensitivity analysis for a model, and, and this is key, not just with respect to a particular parameters, but with respect to certain outcomes. So you are assessing 
how much do the findings with respect to certain model outcomes matter? Um, or how much, are they, how much are they affected by my assumptions about these parameters? And sometimes those outcomes are variables, endogenous variables produced by the model, right? Sometimes these are, are things that are, 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 they relate to, to outcomes over time produced by the model, right? Um, we'll ask, how much does it matter if I change this parameter value by 20%? And in some cases, you know, it, it matters virtually not at all. And maybe for, for other parameters, you get something wildly different as a result. You know, doubling the parameter, um, you know, leads to qualitative change or at least to four times the, uh, the value of a certain quantity of, of great interest or what have you. This is one thing you often look at is, is model outputs of, of interest, those are the outcomes. But another in other times, the outcomes you're interested in are actually findings involving, uh, let's say, trade-offs between policies. And you may find that even though your parameters have a wide variety of uncertainty about them, uh, over a wide variety of assumptions about this set of parameters, it does not one whit change um, that policy A seems to be significantly more efficacious than policy B, or that policy A consistently leads to um, uh, a faster impact, um, but a higher overall burden than policy B, which has slower, slower benefits um, accrued, but yields greater benefits overall. You may find those, those sort of regularities preserved. And one of the things you should realize is that sometimes things that we sweat in terms of the details of model outputs end up coming out in the wash with respect to, in other words, they don't really end up materially impacting the trade off, say, between, um, between policies we're interested in. You can imagine a case, this is, this is an important, important point. Um, we don't need this anymore. Um, you can imagine a situation where you have a model, for example, with, um, I shouldn't be using Jason's stuff. Um, you can have, uh, imagine a model where you have, uh, uh, you know, uh, an outcome, um, say the, um, uh, the cumulative deaths averted by a policy focused on um, uh, preventing uh, renal, renal disease, where you know, the cumulative number of cases averted over time uh, by a certain policy might look like this, and by another policy might look like, uh, like this. Um, and these should be cumulative, so they're, they're not gonna exhibit declines. Um, uh, and you may, you may be interested then in changing parameter values here, um, you know, asking how sensitive in it is it. And with changes to, certain, to say, a, a given parameter, maybe this ends up raising this one by, this blue one by uh, a certain amount, but it ends up raising this, uh, this black one by sort of a, a comparable amount. And so, you know, in uh, the net gain um, uh, of, uh, of, of one policy over another may be more or less preserved, um, or maybe it doubles each or something like that. So there are times where from, uh, uh, the, from the point of view of the high level findings involving say policy differential policy gains or the preferability of one policy versus another, um, it may be a lot less sensitive to parameters than you think, um, uh, just by nominally looking at the outcomes of a given model with respect to how much the, that, that behavior over time changes with respect to a parameter. Maybe changing this parameter from low to high raises both policy A and policy B's gains, but the difference between the two makes it still clear that policy A, you know, uh, secures more gains, but policy B does so, uh, does so sooner. 
something like that. It might change the crossover point, but, um, the time of the crossover. So just be aware that sensitivity analysis is something that we conduct not just on outcomes of models, see endogenous quantities, so that that's most common. We also do it on other high-level findings um, from, from the model. Okay. Um, I mentioned often we have data on model on emergent behavior from a model and uh, often this data we have on emergent behavior of model uh, on things that are endogenously produced by the model is of many different sorts. Sometimes for systems we observe in the world we have data from many different particular places in the model. So there may be many particular observations that we have from the world that we can relate to sort of certain points in the model that we can use to, to scrutinize the model's consistency with evidence from the world. This isn't always true. We'll talk about cases where we don't have much data, but sometimes it is true. And one of the ways in which calibration differs from something like um, uh, uh, univariate um, uh, you know, logistic regression or, or log linear models involving regression is that we will we'll often have a given model um, uh, judged against um, multiple outcomes, um, some data from multiple outcomes. Um, and, and this is what's called uh, calibration. Here we are, we are um, taking data about many pieces of a system and kind of using it, um, using the model's match against all those pieces of data from the world uh, while adjusting our assumptions about parameters that are less well evidenced. So the idea here is, this is what the model gives to us, um, and these ones here, um, maybe I should reverse the direction those arrows are written, because we have evidence in the world and we're comparing it against you know, certain model outcomes. But we do so when modifying our assumptions about certain parameter values that we don't, we don't know. So here, the model's outputting maybe you know, weights of the population over time, and we're adjusting assumptions about to what degree does psychosocial stress lead to emotional eating um, uh, you know, in teenagers. And we're expecting the model, the model findings involving weight over time and involving uh, 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 stated levels of um, uh, physical activity um, uh, engaged in by the individuals as produced by the model to, to match evidence against the world. So we're adjusting um, assumptions about the model we, we don't actually um, have good data for so that the model matches a bunch of data uh, from the world simultaneously. That, that's what this was showing. Um, so calibration is adjusting uh, our assumptions about model parameters so we can best match data from the world. And we're going to talk about parameterization and calibration a little bit more in specific lecture, okay? Uh, specific lectures. Calibration. Sensitivity analysis is altering a model assumption, seeing how much it affects model findings. Calibration is altering, is trying to arrive at estimates for parameters that are less well evidenced, such that the model matches data from the world as, as best as possible, okay? And typically there's uh, an optimization that takes place here where we're trying to intelligently zero in on our assumptions about parameters, what I call unknown parameters here, so that it matches this set of data we have from the world. Yeah? So how is calibration distinguished from validation? Good question. So broadly speaking, um, we will distinguish it in one very important way, okay? Um, which is calibration is part of the model building process. So that's, that's a process where we're, we're leveraging all the so data, that we're, evidence we have in the world, data we have in the world, to build our model. And some of it goes into parameter estimates directly, and assumptions. 
Some of it we can't put into the model because you know, it relates to things the model generates, but we use it for calibration um, of uh, other parameters whose estimates we're less confident about, right? Um, and we particularly put it into ones where the model's sensitive to them. Um, and we adjust those parameters. And that's all part of model building. Now, what's good in model practice is if you can take some data from the model and put it aside so it's not used to build the model, but it's instead used once you have a model that's been built, you, you judge it against that data. It's, it's called out of sample validation. In other words, it wasn't used to build up the model, it's used to test the model once built. Now, I need to be clear because um, you will find two different ways of doing that, um, except one way, is to take a certain type of data aside, put it aside and, and parameterize, calibrate the model, and then use that, that type of data that wasn't used when building the model to test the model. So, um, you know, you might have, um, uh, you might have data, for example, on um, certain types of outcome measures, but, but not others. Um, so maybe you have data on cases with, um, you know, uh, stage three and worse, um, uh, chronic kidney disease that you use to, to calibrate and, uh, and parameterize the model uh, together with other data from the literature and sources. And then you have data on early stage kidney disease you're using to test the model, something like that. Um, it's not the best example, but, but it's one. Um, in other cases, and what you'll see is a very common thing, what you, and, and this is actually really easy to do compared to the last, you, you build the model based on data to a certain point in time. So maybe you have data from across a whole swack of different indicators for parameterization and for calibration. Use data only up till, let, let's say uh, 20, 2015. You build the model and calibrate it against that data. So you have a model that performs well in accounting for the data before 2015, in part because it's been calibrated to it, right? And then you say, okay, so you think you're such a hot shot model, right? Um, uh, let's see how you do in predicting the last four years of data since 2015. And we'll compare it against the empirical evidence we have from 2015 to 2019 and see just how well the model measures up. You know. um, <coughs> and you end up um, using that as your, your validation tool. And that's, um, there's trade offs for both. We do that a lot, and it's a very common modeling practice. You, you want to develop confidence that the model matches historical patterns, and you have a cut point which you use as kind of your cut point for subsequent model uh, uh, validation or confidence building where it was not used to build the model, but you're using, seeing if the model across all these different indicators predicts well what's happening. And if it's not, it starts to give you clues of okay, where it's off. Now, the, an important point here, though, is that calibration as part of the model building process, a lot of people get stuck up in the idea that calibration is just a routine process of estimating parameters. It's transactional. You just go and you, you match it up and you get the best parameters for the model and you fit it in and life is good. Um, it turns out it doesn't work that way with dynamic models typically. Um, this is in contrast to something like a linear regression um, where, you know, you, you turn the crank and it, it gives you the, the beta coefficients coming out of it and confidence intervals and so on. And it gives you the best line that fits it. And you say, you might be happier with it or not, but it's often, you know, that, that's what you got. Um, it, it, it's the best match, right? With calibration, it is not, 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 it is not, it is definitely not, it is definitely not that. Because often what you end up finding is the model 
no matter what you do, just won't match certain things. Or it matches these things, but not others. And that is not, this is not a transactional um, process. It, you learn about why the model doesn't match things. You learn, you learn about um, what things are probably off in the model, where, it's, where it might be thrown off, and you learn about data problems, as I mentioned. And so, in my view, calibration, in contrast to validation, um, calibration is a huge learning opportunity. This is, if you rush through it, you short circuit the opportunity to learn from the model a lot of the time. And it's, it's a labor of love. You gotta, you, you gotta devote yourself to it. But, um, but calibration is your chance to learn um, where, uh, to learn to think like the model and to learn to um, uh, more deeply about where your church thinking is captured by the model is off base. And so this is very much part of the learning process. Validation tends to be a more sort of gating process. You, you sort of say, okay, the model's in good shape. One advantage of doing the calibration against time-based calibration, where you say everything from 2015 onwards is, um, you know, give me some test the model or what have you. The one nice thing about that is that over time, if the model's a living document, you're keeping on using it, you know, more, more information comes in and you often have a larger body of, of evidence you can use for validation purposes. You also end up having um, ability to rebase the model at a later time and then um, test it against, uh, against later data, yeah, okay. Okay, now I want to talk just a little bit about um, filtering, because filtering is something that uh, I, I have um, great uh, personal commitment to, but, but I, I think it's, uh, uh, it's a hallmark of um, uh, today's um, uh, growing use of data science um, that, um, that we have increasing options for um, uh, for use of uh, filtering with dynamic models. And the idea here is to avoid open loop models. Traditionally, we build a model, we go through a lot of work to calibrate it, to parameterize it, and we finally get it through testing, that, uh, through, um, through validation stages, and, and we have the model and we end up using it. But the truth is that um, often we end up over time, getting more evidence. We over time end up learning from the world. We end up uh, making observations that challenge that model or it could inform it. And the idea with um, filtering is to move beyond open loop models. Um, the example I gave in the previous boot camp, which I'll give here is, um, you may have a very good model at this point how to get from here back to your hotel or from here to your home. But, uh, you know, I, I don't live all that far from here. Uh, I bike to work, I, I do it very regularly. But if I, if I would go home, it would be a full, it would be disastrous um, uh, for me to go home with my eyes closed. I don't depend, my model is very sophisticated about how to go home. I, I have pretty good understanding about where the crosswalks are, where the sidewalk ends, where the construction barriers are, a lot of these days. You know, I know where the stoplights are, et cetera, but, but if I tried to go home with my eyes closed, I'd be in a world of hurt, right? I probably wouldn't get home. Um, and, uh, and then my students would really be in a pickle because they'd be the ones presenting. Um, so um, so this, this gets to these, this uh, interface between machine learning and dynamic models. Um, there's a growing use uh, of machine learning techniques uh, together with dynamic models in a way that allow us to keep models continuously informed. And my group is, is I'm pleased to say, at the forefront of this, but we're not alone. There's been some very good work that's come out of uh, Singapore, uh, National University of Singapore, and, um, uh, and from uh, a number of other quarters uh, in recent years <coughs> with respect to several of these techniques. Um, uh, including both in North America and elsewhere. Um, and <clears throat> there's, um, 
a number of techniques that I've uh, described in this quarter. We might have time to discuss particle filtering on Friday, but the basic idea here is that you are trying to go from a situation where you have just, it's almost like with a model, maybe you built that model six months ago, maybe you built it at the beginning of the year, and now um, you're trying to use it on an ongoing basis. But if I could give it another analogy, it's almost as if, for most uses of models, it's almost as if we're operating with a weather forecast as it was, as it was formulated January 1st. And the weather forecast forecasted what the weather will be today, but it's increasingly outdated, right? Um, and so filtering provides a way to avoid this. Filtering provides a way to use the model to look forward, but in a way that's constantly updated by the latest understanding of weather, as it were. The latest understanding of what's played out since when that model was created. And so this provides a way to do something more similar to what we have with weather. We have may have a very good weather model we used as of January 1st to predict the weather you know, going forward, but it would be a fool's errand to use that model as it was in January 1st to predict today's weather because so much has been observed since then. And so what weather models achieve is you know, a way of incorporating what's actually observed for a weather, like yesterday and the day before, into the weather model to then predict today's weather based on all that added information. And that's what we do with filtering techniques. We take a model and we inform it as data comes in, we inform it with data all along, and we use it to ground this model, um, to ground this dynamic model. And um, the model's understanding of what's going on in the world is informed by its predictions from yesterday, but it's also informed and sort of corrected by um, this data from the world, but both of those are known to be fallible. So the data from the world is very incomplete, it's, it's ambiguous, and it only relates to certain areas of the system, but the model, um, uh, model predictions are also incomplete and, and uh, have uncertainties. And this, this particle filtering provides a way of putting together the model's expectations based on the data um, up, up through yesterday, together with the estimates from today that were observed, or the, the observations from today, in a way that grounds the model's understanding about what's probably going on in the world in the sense of re-estimating the entire state of the model. And what this can allow us to do is to, where, where the dotted line is, look forward from now, taking into account not just the model as it existed when it was created back here at time zero, but all this data that's been going on since then, including stochastics as they happen to play out in terms of, say, your number of cases associated with measles that occurred in this period of time. And this may have been stochastically driven, but the fact that there were very, 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 very few, consistently few cases of measles reported in these ensuing months tells us a lot implicitly about what's going on elsewhere in the system. Like, there must be a growing number of susceptibles, because no two ways about it. If people aren't getting infected, um, uh, then it, it means the number of susceptibles must be growing, because bursts are coming in, that's the inflow coming in, and there's nobody going out getting infected, or very, very few. So the, number, the stock of susceptibles must be rising. It's like, you know, it's inexorable. And what that means is the chance of an outbreak coming is rising. So a model, a particle filtering provides this way of meshing model, model um, understanding with incoming data in a way that clues us into the underlying situation throughout the system, not just about the pieces we see with the data, um, but also corrects model expectations. And what this means is that a model that's grounded in this way can look forward with much greater confidence. Um, I won't go into this because we may have a lecture on tomorrow about it, but we can predict, um, say, coming outbreaks vastly more effectively with a model that's informed in this way. And we also get kind of a, a tomographic view of the population. So using a model like this, we can use the data till now, even though that data is only a piece of the system, to illuminate an understanding of what's going on throughout the system. Illuminate our understanding of latent factors, which are not themselves measured, 
but where what we do measure together with model structure tells us something about what's going on in other areas of the model. Um, so other, and by extension, other areas of the system. So the idea here is that the data that's coming in may be from one or, or just a small number of places within the system that we have evidence on, but in these coupled systems that we characterize using, using dynamic models, what we measure at one particular area of the system or a small number of areas is coupled with the rest of the system. So what we observe here tells us a lot about what's going on elsewhere in the system. And in particular, the logic of the model captures those connections and allows, in a way that allows us to illuminate, these are various latent states that are not directly observed, but the data that's come in implies things about it, much as if I just observe people coming in the door, maybe I don't observe what's going on in the corridor itself, but if people are just streaming in this door in large numbers, I know there have got to be a lot of people in the corridor out there. It tells me something, even though I don't see it directly, the logic of the situation is such that those people are coming from somewhere, and the place they're coming from is, is that place just outside of the doors, which, which is the corridor. Um, and one of the most powerful features of this is it lets us always have an updated model for doing evaluation of interest. So it's kind of like we have a GPS system. Um, many people in the room, everyone in the room is of an age um, that you will remember the world without GPS, right? You remember printing out directions to your hotel from you know, the airport when you got in or, or, or printing out the directions to so-and-so's house from home. And, and, and that was good. It was a lot better than operating without directions, but it was fragile. It was fragile in the sense that if we, if we got lost at some point, we wouldn't know where to go because we have direction from A to B, but now we're in C and we don't know, we don't know where to go to B, right? Um, we have directions from A to B, but we're not in A anymore. We're, we're someplace off and we don't know which way to turn. Um, that was a lot of the problems with directions, right? They were fragile, they were contingent on where we were coming from. But with these sorts of regrounding of a model, we have something much richer than this. It's almost like a GPS. It knows where we are at any point. And so it will tell us, when we evaluate intervention, we'll say, okay, okay, the model might not have expected you to be here now, but if you're here, this, is, this would be a more effective intervention than this other one. Because the model is being constantly regrounded with evidence its understanding of the world has been shaped by that evidence. And if you evaluate intervention A versus intervention B, it'll be doing it savvy to that new interface, to that new, new evidence. As much as the GPS, it didn't expect you perhaps to be here now. Um, uh, but, um, but given that you're there, you can say, get me to my hotel from where I am, and it will be rerouting you from where you actually are. It didn't expect you to be there, but it'll reroute you because it's getting updates about your location and correcting its understanding of where you should be at this time. Um, and that's what, that's what these particle filter uh, models do. They let us update. Okay, I wanna make, uh, I wanna finish up here, but I wanna make um, one other observation that I, uh, or, or two other observations. One is, one is this, ladies and gentlemen. Um, we talked early about validation, and I kind of got caught up in this, in, in talking specifically about the broader gated world. But suffice it to say that there are particular quarters of the modeling community, particularly in system dynamics, who view model validation as not predominantly a big gating step, where you say yay or nay about a model. You say fails the test, you know, go back, go back to your row um, and, you know, rethink. But as a series of measures designed to enhance learning and to check model understanding. And system dynamics has a rich repertoire, um, best encapsulated, to my knowledge, in the work of uh, an edited volume by Randers from the 1970s of all things, um, 
into its early 80s. It's, it's in my um, lab if anyone's interested, which basically lay out a series of tests that a model should go through in the process of building it to, to kind of assess, is this model ready? Is it, is it up to snow? And these tests include a lot of things that that might seem modest, but are very important. An example here um, that's a routine one in engineering is what's called um, a dimensional homogeneity test. And, and basically, this is just making sure you're not doing something really silly, like adding adding people, you know, dollars dollars to dollars per day, or something like that. Um, then making sure the model is dimensionally consistent. Um, you're not uh, adding together two quantities which are in different dimension, um, or comparing two things which are measured in different ways. And this may sound silly, but believe me, it is an extremely common rookie mistake for someone, for example, to compare a value of a flow and a value of a stock in a system dynamics model, and in the model, in the model formulas, and that's meaningless because if you change time units. Um, it will totally change how that turns out. You're, you're measuring something. It's like comparing a, a square a square foot to a foot. It's like comparing something two feet long. Is that greater than two square feet or one square foot? It, it, it doesn't make sense. It's like asking about you know um, uh, comparing um, amount of time with a length or something like that. It's, it's meaningless. And yet, models sometimes include these nonsensical things. So we talked about dimensional homogeneity tests. But another one is extreme value tests. And this is really useful. And it's very common in dynamic modeling. You take your model, and you try it out with extreme values for certain assumptions. So you say, OK, suppose we have no contacts going on with people. Or suppose we had each person per day having 1,000 contacts. How does the model behave? Suppose we had a very rapid recovery from infection. Suppose it was very slow, by contrast. Suppose we assume that comorbidity A and comorbidity B were independent. Suppose they were, uh, by contrast, they were heavily coupled. You know, A really drives complications with B very quickly. How does the model behave? And this gives us a better intuition, but it also will sometimes show there's a logical problem with the model. So we do these extreme value tests. And in this, in the system dynamics canon, there's a number of these tests that have been laid out, not just extreme value, but other types of tests as well, to sort of test your model out. And this is less a matter of, you know, you're a bad model and don't deserve to be, uh, to, to, you're grounded, you know, you can't get to come out of your home. Um, you gotta be re redone. Verse, it's not a matter so much of that as kind of um, learning from the model and working towards a better model and figuring out where it has gaps. Um, so just be aware that there's kind of validation in the large and validation in the small. And different modeling communities um, uh, have formalized processes for each of those. And system dynamics is tended as a discipline to focus, or tended as a methodology. Um, to focus on validation in the small more and, and confidence building and learning as part of that process, whereas industrial engineering use of discrete event simulation is tended to focus more on validation in the large. And different literatures, different norms, um, but you will sometimes want to know about it if you seek to publish in certain venues which are dominated by models of, from the other discipline. Um, okay. Um, I want to comment just a little bit before we finish. What if I don't have data from my model? Um, and again, I, I mentioned this the other day in a passing way, and I don't want to um, beat a dead horse, but there is there are uh, varying thoughts in the community about the degree to which it is fitting, proper, and insightful to use models to, in the context of, uh, of impoverished evidence about the world, okay? Um, one observation here, however, 
is that when we look at the models we build, a lot more understanding and knowledge goes into them than is in the data in the form of, of, of particular you know, parameter estimates, for example, or in the form of calibration, data for calibration. Um, often what we capture in the model structure, the fact that we use, we assume, we posit this natural history of disease, for example, for different conditions. We assume there's an asymptomatic, uh, uh, there's an asymptomatic mode of this condition and a non-asymptomatic mode. We assume carriers exist as well as those who are actively infectious in other ways. Um, and uh, that, that is elements of structure that we capture. Um, you know, the stages of change for behavior change. That's, that's knowledge and assumptions being captured in a different way than just a number. It has to do with the structural assumptions of a model. And often we use evidence or understanding from the fields in model structure that really isn't just numbers. You know, in statistics we get um, quite, you know, while well, we deal with um, functional forms and, and you know, the, uh, uh, the distributional assumptions for things, um, often we get caught up in the numerics of it. We're dealing with, with particular precise numbers, same in machine learning. But, um, but within the dynamic modeling area, many people believe the model structure um, is where some of the most important assumptions lie. And indeed, with, with a model structure that's off base, um, it is, uh, you get, you can get often very different behavior out. You may be unable to reproduce patterns of qualitative, um, qualitative observation of the system. Um, whereas context with the right model structure, you, you, you're able to, to capture people's qualitative experience with the system. Um, I, if you don't have the data, you can still gain, I, I'm a big believer that with models, you can still gain, uh, give deep insight into how process assumptions, you know, assumptions about the structure of the, uh, the process, the, the model structure, affect possible outcomes from the models, and, and interventions, how they might impact what's likely to play out over time, which might be more likely to have an immediate effect compared to a slower effect, et cetera. Um, what I will say is I'm a big believer in the notion that models help us learn faster, deeper, and more reliably from evidence. So if we don't have much information about the world, I tend to fall in the camp that says this is a situation where models are still really valuable and arguably even most valuable because we need to make use of each piece of data as much as we can. Models help with that. And when new evidence comes in, we need to make use of it as much as we can. And models help with that. We help learn from new evidence. We help learn from evidence, as John Sturman says, in a complex world. If you haven't, if those in the room haven't read John Sturman's article, Learning from Evidence in a Complex World, I would urge you to do so in the strongest terms. It's a, it's a, it's a brilliant work, masterfully done, appeared in the pages of American Journal of Public Health in 2006 for good reason, because of its implications for public health, but it has a much broader scope than that. So, um, it's John Sturman here, uh, so Jay Sturman, um, and uh, it's uh, learning uh, from evidence uh, in a complex world. Now, uh, John is a um, professor at MIT um, and uh, sort of the uh, the currently um, sort of current uh, most most prominent, well known, and established system dynamics uh, modeler. He's also someone quite open to agent based modeling and other techniques. Um, and I would I would strongly recommend uh, that article as thoughtfully talking about this learning learning from evidence. Um, uh, in short. Reasoning about a formal model rather than a mental model helps us 
helps us explain puzzling data, helps us elicit tacit knowledge from other data. Um, it can aid in prioritizing data collection through sensitivity analysis and, and by helping us to realize certain data items that are more central to understanding of the dynamics. Um, and it can help us understand how, how theory about the world relates to, that, uh, to the data that's, uh, that's observed. Dynamic models are not merely data. Um, they depend heavily on not just data, but theory in the form of model structure. And uh, they can help us reason fruitfully, even in the events of less data, about behavior in the world. And they can aid in theory building, right? Like that shelling segregation model, for example. Um, it is inevitable, ladies and gentlemen, that we live in a world with change. We live in a world where uh, data generating processes change. And if we live in models that are beholden to our data generating processes, that, are, that, that depend on the vagaries of the associations that happen to have been in place for the past year or two or three, we, we skate on thin ice. Um, and when we build dynamic models that, that um, uh, are anticipating certain changes, um, we have to recognize that even the most detailed dynamic models, while they may ca capture causal relationships, uh, they also will tend to diverge from the empirical situation. Much as, again, it would be unwise for me to walk home with my eyes closed because maybe they'd be doing some construction work on campus or will block some path on campus that I'm used to taking and I'll crash through a barrier. Um, and um, you know, we, we must recognize that we live in a changing world. Interventions change things. And, um, and uh, you know, a dynamic model provides a way, in as much as it captures positive causal structure, of reasoning about what's likely to happen in uh, an intervention scenario. Um, but models are best used as, as learning tools uh, over time. Uh, as we as, uh, make new observations for the world, there's a need to reground the model and to update our understanding. Um, I would note, again, this, this um, uh, one of the dimensions I articulated uh, two days ago between rich empirically grounded models on the one hand and stylized models. Empirically grounded models often explicating theory in Ross, Herman, uh, Ross uh, Hammond's term, and, and stylized models often to serve to, um, to build theory. Um, uh, stylized models uh, often help us think through the implications of just a few simple assumptions. Simple, but uh, simple in the sense of descriptively simple, but but in a, in a complex process. And they can help us speed up the learning process by identifying inconsistencies in our thinking and sharpening our thinking. Um, uh, and they can help us kind of build, build theory in a certain area. So I've talked now about models and data. Um, I'm going to be speaking after the break, um, very briefly, showing how we can conduct two of these processes, parameterization, uh, and excuse, excuse me, uh, uh, model uh, sensitivity analyses and calibration um, in the context of some of the models we've been working with for this boot camp. So you'll see in concrete terms how we can go about using modeling tools to give us insight into uh, the sensitivity of model results on one parameter versus another. And uh, we'll also take a brief look at calibration as well. Okay, so that will be after the break. Um, if you want to make use of uh, the food out there, um, I will note that I brought in from my backyard um, uh, a set of plums today. Um, and I have a bag of them next to the fruit, which you're welcome to enjoy, OK? They're, they're, they are sweet with Saskatchewan goodness, <laughs> OK? Yeah, it's a stock of plums. And if you bite them, you'll get a flow of, 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 of juice. <laughs> yeah, deplete, deplete the stock. Be, there's more where they come from. <laughs>